Hello and welcome to today's webinar. It's our solution deep dive, the Expedient Push Button DR solution powered by Zerto. Today's event is brought to you by Actual Tech Media. And my name is David Davis. I'm your moderator for today's event. Now you were invited to this event because you expressed interest in the Expedient DR as a service solution at some event in the past. The idea of this event is to give you a solution deep dive into this product and show you how it works. And this is going to be a fast paced demo heavy event. So uh, I hope you're looking forward to that. I hope you came here to see the solution and get all your questions answered. So on this event, you'll learn how easy disaster recovery can be with disaster recovery as a service. You'll find out what makes Expedient and Zerto a magical combination for DR simplicity and like we said, you'll see push button DR in action. Uh, as I said, my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media. I honored to be the moderator on this event. On today's event, you'll hear from Heisbert Jensen Van Dorn, who is your presenter. He's a technology evangelist from Zerto, as well as AJ Kurtafik from Expedient, principal technologist at Expedient. Uh, Heisbert and AJ. Thank you so much for being on the event today. It's a pleasure Thank to be you, here. Thank you, David. Now, before we jump into it, uh, Heisbert will be our first presenter, uh, but just a couple of things that you should know. Feel free to use that questions box there in the GoToWebinar control panel to ask all your questions about disaster recovery as a service and the Zerto product. Uh, we wanna get your questions answered. We'll be doing a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event, and we have experts on hand to answer your questions throughout today's demonstration, so don't hesitate to ask. I also wanna call your attention to a number of handouts. There are four different handouts there in the GoToWebinar handouts tab. You can click on those. There's a case study. Uh, there's uh, information on the Expedient Enterprise Cloud, uh, as well as a solution brief on uh, how to ensure IT resilience at the push of a button with Expedient and uh, let's see, there's also uh, one other one there, the um, Zerto infographic on disaster recovery as a service. So make sure that you check those out. Go ahead and download those now. You won't be able to download those after the event. So make sure you go ahead and uh, just grab those now so you can check them out after the event. Now, before I hand it over to Heisbert, we first have a poll question. I wanna bring that up now. The question that you should see on your screen is simply, do you manage your own DR? And it's a simple yes or no question, should be easy to answer. I'll share the results of this poll with you and you can see how you stack up with your peers. All right, lots of responses already coming in. Thank you, everyone. All right, let me go ahead and share the results of this poll with you. And it says that 63% on the event today, manage their own DR. Uh, AJ, what's your take on that? Um, it's uh, it's not uh, entirely surprising. Uh, a lot of people are still, you know, this is the thing that works. Uh, this is the thing that we've been doing for a very long time. We have our very particular ways of doing things. So it's not terribly surprising that people manage their own DR and that's fine. And uh, if it works, it works. Uh, but we, we're looking at, uh, we're trying to present uh, another option here that might be able to help you and simplify things. Absolutely, I, I know by the end of this, this event, uh, everyone will learn uh, just how easy DR can be. So with that, let's not delay anymore. Let's get started. And I'm going to hand over control to our first presenter, uh, Heisbert, take it away. Yes, thank you very much, David, um, and and thank you everyone for joining this uh, this wonderful solution deep dive. Now, uh, before I get started, uh, I'm going to do a quick recap of what we also presented at the first session, and that's a little overview of what Zerto's IT resilience platform is. So Zerto's IT, IT resilience platform is a platform that allows you to protect your application, that allows you to mobilize your applications, and it's all based on a core of continuous data protection. And continuous data protection includes always on replication, journal-based recovery, application consistency grouping, but also things like long-term retention. Now that's the engine that moves the data. Um, 
if you actually want to use the data, you need the workflows, you need the automation to be able to do something with the data. So that's included in the platform as well. So they work between different clouds, multi-cloud, they offer you workload mobility and they give you the flexibility to do non-disruptive failover testing. Uh, besides that, analytics and control is included as well. So you get the right reporting for like auditing purposes or historical reporting that's all built into the IT resilience platform. Now, as this is a solution deep dive, I'm going to go deeper into what our architecture looks like, um, but also into some of the components of CDP. Now, um, what we are, we are a software scale out solution. Um, and, and that's our main architecture. Basically consists out of two components. One of them is the what we call the ZVM, the Jitter Virtual Manager, uh, simply the management component that you install on a server um, that you tie to the vCenter or SCVMM in your environment and we'll use that to do orchestration and we'll use that to auto discover all your components in your data center. Uh, you can get it up and running within minutes. It's really easy to do. Now, as soon as that one is up and running, you'll install a second component, which we call virtual replication appliance. And this is the true scale out piece of our um, solution. The virtual replication appliance is responsible for all the continuous block level replication. It has things uh, built in compression. It's, and it's a really small VM. It's like one vCPU, three gigabytes of memory by default. Um, so that's really low from an overhead perspective. And that's what you install on each and every hypervisor host you have in your environment. And that's how we scale. So we can scale large environments, small environments. Now, the way it looks like in a disaster recovery as a service solution is a little bit different. Of course, you still have the ZVM, the, the virtual manager, the, the replication appliances running in your environment. But those same components also run on the Expedient environment, but that's not visible to you because, hey, they are managed by Expedient. The only thing that you'll have is what we call a Zerto Cloud Connector, and that's basically your endpoint to, um, to Expedient. So that gives you resource masking, gives you all kinds of security benefits as well. So it's a really simple approach, and that's part of the value of, of working with a partner like Expedient as well. So let's focus on some of the key elements within continuous data protection, always on replication, journal-based recovery, and application consistency grouping. And I believe I'm gonna start with the application consistency grouping. And the reason why is because that's what you want to protect. You want to protect your applications. And applications don't consist of a single VM anymore. It's multiple VMs. It might be multiple applications that are linked to each other with different database servers of different vendors. Now we have a concept, what we call virtual protection groups and virtual protection groups allow you to simply group those VMs that make up an application or an application chain and protect them as one entity. And what that means is that you're not only protecting them as one entity, but one logical container, but you're also recovering them as one entity. That means that every single component of your application, every single VM will be recovered to the exact same point in time. The VPG is also the container where you pre-configure all your recovery settings on. So what's the boot order? Um, and what network do they need to uh, be brought up in? Uh, and while we do that, we'll maintain the consistency across all those VMs and maintain the right order fidelity. And that's really key for consistent recovery as well. Besides that, anything you're used to in your VMware or, or Hyper-V environment will still work. Things like vMotion, storage vMotion, DRS, storage DRS, you name it, it's all supported because we're so deeply integrated into that virtualization platform. And that's exactly what we are. We're really deeply integrated into that virtualization platform because the way we replicate is hypervisor based. And we've seen this trend going on for many, many years already. We've got servers being virtualized. Hey, VMware got to where it is right now by starting server virtualization. Um, and as we move forward, more and more components, really key components of the virtual data center got into that hypervisor, networking, storage, and with the introduction of Zerto back in 2010, also replication, completely software only, no snapshots. We use continuous block level replication. That means you don't need to, you don't need to schedule anything. It's always on. It's completely agnostic to whatever storage or hardware you use. 
and it simply gives you an environment that's always protected by deeply integrating into that hypervisor. Now, how does that replication work? Um, so VMs are generating changes and all those changes are being captured and sent to a journal. So every VM, um, that journal, every VM gets its own journal. That journal is basically a queue, a first in first out queue that maintains all the changes. And as those changes enter that journal, we insert checkpoints and checkpoints are actually points in time you can recover to. And we create those checkpoints every five seconds. So you can see there's a granularity of seconds in there for recovery. And I'll, I'll zoom into that a little bit deeper in one of my next slides. Now, the journal has a set history, which could be time related, could be size related, but let's, for this example, take time related. Let's say I wanna keep four hours of changes. We can go up to 30 days, by the way. Um, as soon as a write or an IO is older than four hours, we'll push it off to the replica disk. So it's a completely continuous streaming way of protecting data. We're simply pushing or applying, as we call that internally, to the replica disk. So the single part of truth is the replica disk and the journal combined. And that's part of our magic as well. So how does that journal work? As I told you, uh, we create a checkpoint every five seconds. And what it allows you to do is really get granular recovery. And that's really powerful, especially when, for example, ransomware hits. Um, it's, not, it's not if, but when, and nowadays, especially with the, 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 the rising um, um, threat of ransomware. So let's say ransomware hits you, and apologies for the time notation. It's, uh, I'm, I'm a European, so that's, that's, how we, that's how we um show our time. So it's 5 p.m., ransomware hits. I don't want to recover encrypted data. So what I do is I simply take a point in time, five seconds before the actual encryption started, and I am able to recover that data unencrypted. And I can do that for an entire data center, entire site. I can do it for a specific application, my file server cluster, for example, I can do it for specific VMs or even files. So if one folder is encrypted, I simply restore that folder from how it was five seconds ago, an hour ago, up to 30 days ago. That's because we use that flexible journal-based recovery. Now, I told you automation and orchestration is key as well. We have the engine that moves the data, we have the journal that allows you to go back in time, but now we need those workflows to actually do something with that data. So let's dig into those workflows. I only pick a, a few um, and I'll start with the failover workflow. Uh, this is a typical environment. I've got a production site. I've got my recovery site in Expedient's case. That's Expedient. And what happens as soon as I click that failover button, and that's only a few steps because I only need to select what I need to fail over, my entire site, the application, a VM. And as soon as I click that failover button, what we will do is we'll bring up those VMs on the target side, attach the disks as they were, we boot them up in the right order, we'll give them a new IP address if necessary, and you're up and running again. And this is all automated and you can all predefine that. And that's great for if you want to do a failover, but like I uh, tend to say to uh, our shared customers is you don't really have a DR uh, uh, solution if you don't test it. So that's why we've got failover test environment or workflow built in as well. And basically what we do is exactly the same thing but we allow you to select a different network, an isolated network. And that allows you to simply test it while your environment is still running and while your environment is still protected. So we don't interrupt production and we don't interrupt protection. That's really key as well, because if you compare that to some of the more legacy DR solutions out there, uh, I, and I've, I've worked with a, with, with a couple of them, you actually had to stop replication to be able to test your DR. That means you're unprotected while you're testing a DR. That's a little bit strange uh, to me, actually. That's something we don't do. So it's completely non-disruptive. And all of this is managed through a really simple and easy to use interface. Um, and actually how Expedient integrates with us is actually part of the demo that's, uh, that's following up. Now, before I hand it over to AJ, I, I quickly want to highlight some of the things uh, uh, between uh, of our partnership. I mean, Expedient has been a partner since our early days, since 2012. They're right now a platinum partner. I'm really proud of that. They're a very valued member of our technical advisory board. 
Um, they've even won a 2018 Growth Partner of the Year. But the most impressive, impressive piece is, is that they've been positioned in Gartner's Magic Quadrant for DRAS for already three years. So that's that's really impressive. Now, with, without further ado, I don't want to uh, show you more slides. I'll hand it over to AJ and he'll be able to actually demo the push button DR environment. That's uh, that's pretty cool. So good luck, AJ. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna, I am actually going to jump in and, and talk about what we refer to as our push button DR. Um, this is our simplified user interface. So we are a VMware cloud provider partner. Um, what we present to our customers is our Expedia Enterprise Cloud. It is uh, based on vCloud Director. So we have one interface for all of the VMs, uh, all of our virtual data centers, and including our Zerto console. Um, as part of our workflow automation of push button DR, we fail over the public IP subnet, um, which allows us to maintain that network configuration uh, consistency. So I think a lot of people, if you're managing your own uh, disaster recovery, part of your process may include a re-IP. It may include DNS changes, um, things that need to be manually done and hope that propagation of DNS works out, which sometimes it doesn't, or it takes a really, really long time for it to do that. Um, because we handle the public IP space as well, this allows us to drop that RTO from hours down to minutes um, and allows our customers to do the failovers in a much more seamless fashion. Uh, and because our firewalls are in both data centers and are linked to this, all of the security policies go with it too. So our firewalls, um, any sort of IDS, IPS, that goes with it. So this is what it looks like uh, in Slideware, and then I'll show uh, what it looks like in the actual interface. So we start our day, we have a public IP, we have private network gateway IPs, and we have our primary site. We bring in our secondary site, and we actually turn up that virtual server replication and the orchestration. So this is where we build our VPGs and we actually start moving the data back and forth. Our public internet IP is being broadcasted out by BGP, so we have an actual announcement going out. So when I mentioned the propagation of DNS, internet routing happens a lot faster. Um, and so BGP is just announcing the address that says 206.210.68.123 is coming out of this data center. Um, but let's say it's a bad Tuesday and bad things have happened. We kick off the actual, uh, the actual failover. The private network gateway goes over so you don't have to re-IP anything internally. There's an egress swap that moves the public internet IP from primary data center to secondary data center, and it's re-announced by BGP. So now my remote users and my remote site VPN customers don't have to wonder where it went to, or they have to go to you know, expedientdr.com to get to the DR version of the website. They're going to the exact same places they went before. They don't even, <clears throat> they may see an outage page, they may see 404s, but they're not going to see it forever. Uh, and they don't have to know to go to the secondary website in order to continue doing their work. But you didn't, you, you guys didn't come here for slides. You really didn't. Uh, and I don't blame you. So we're actually going to slide that in. So there it is. So this is our expedient enterprise cloud interface. Um, our 701 data center is based in Indianapolis. Our ACM data center is based here in Pittsburgh. It's actually about mm, eight stories below me right now. Um, and what we have here is this is a, one of our demo environments. Um, for a quick topology look, uh, you can see that these two data centers are linked together. They are a data center group. And as part of that, this is what the network topology actually looks like. Um, 701 and ACM are linked together from a layer two standpoint, and we have our edges in each data center. Those are NSX edges, uh, which allows us to link them together in an active standby configuration. So all of our external internet traffic is going out of ACM, and that is a, a function of, it, of NSX. There isn't really an active active function in there. Um, so what we have is everything going out uh, ACM, and in the event of a failover, we would come in here and click and uh, click swap egress points, which would move the active 
edge to 701, which would fail our public internet traffic over. Um, all of the firewalls, all of the NSX rules, everything that we have as part of the NSX configuration is configured on both sides automatically. So we don't have to really think about where everything is and do we have those firewall rules in the right place? And if I do a failover, does my firewall know that I'm doing that? Um, and it allows us to do that, that cutover. So let's get into Zerto itself. Um, so this is inside of our VCD instance. Uh, this is a custom thing that we wrote. So this is uh, pretty much an exclusive to us um, that allows uh, our Zerto interface to live inside of here. So you can jump between your, uh, if I go into my data centers and I click on here, I can go in and see here's all my data centers that we have run, or here's all my virtual machines that we have running. Here's all of our networks um, that are all running all the, the applications that we have in our demo environment and we can flip right over to the Zerto console and not have to leave this interface or go to a different pane of glass or try to look back at two different things it's all together so we have some vpgs uh pre-built in here uh and i'm going to go through one relatively quickly so this is our uh we have four vms in this one after it loads you'll see it up here four vms will be protected with 256 gigs of protection. Um, we have some IOPS, but not many. Um, and as we go through and edit this, this VPG, it's kind of going to break down all the actual components of what this VPG actually is and what it's doing. Um, so what this VPG is built around is a demo app that we have that has two application servers, a web server, and a database server. So we have four VMs of the I think 30 that we have in our data in our in our demo environment that are as part of this application of this VPG. Um, give it a name; it could be anything really. Um, you can set your priorities. So high high priority VPGs will be uh, brought up before medium ones if you link multiple VPGs together. Um, so there's a high, medium, and low. These are all of the VMs. Uh, there's 86 unprotected VMs. These are the four selected. Now, there's 86 here. There's actually 30 in one data center and 50 in the other. Um, and this is actually both because you can replicate in either direction. So it's not like I have to always go to my primary site to get to my secondary. I can go in here and pull VMs from either side. So in this case, all, all four of these are in one data center. I have the option to define a boot order. Uh, in this case, we're bringing them all up together, but I can click add group and I can say, hey, I want my database server to be up before the rest of my environment be, or the rest of my application because the database being up is important to this is in, is important to be up before everything else or else the application will crash and fail and then I have to go restart everything and do a bunch of troubleshooting which I don't want to do. Uh, you can add multiple groups so let's say I want my web server to be down here so database comes up once database comes up bring up my application servers once my application servers are up bring up my web server. So you can actually build in that tiering and you can do all sorts of boot delays um, to say, you know, here's where I want all of these to start. I know that this database server takes five minutes to start. So I'm going to set the uh, boot delay to 300 seconds so that these don't start until that database server is up and running. So we'll go next. Um, we replicate uh, to Expedia Enterprise Cloud and it says local here. And the reason for that is that because we're using v, uh, vCloud Director, we have uh, everything under one pane of glass. And so it looks like it's going locally. It's not. There's two different data centers. They're about six hours apart. If you haven't been to the, the Midwest Appalachia area, uh, so Indianapolis and Pittsburgh are about six hours apart. But because they're being managed in the same environment, it looks like it's replicating locally. They're going to two different places. Um, these are my default recovery uh, hosts and data stores. This is uh, a cluster, um, but we have other environments that we could uh, recover to. You can build service profiles for your SLA. So this is my medium RPO with a 24 hour journal. So I have, 20, I have 24 hours of journal history so I can go back to multiple checkpoints in that and I'll get to that in a second. Um, and my target RPO alert is 15 minutes. 
I can go in here and, and set a custom one and drop this down from 15 minutes to 15 seconds. Um, I can take my journal history from one day to one hour. So if I'm replicating a lot and I don't want to keep a long journal history, um, there's a way to do that. There's some advanced settings in here to get more, even more granular, but that's a pretty straightforward way to do it. Uh, and then from an advanced uh, standpoint, I can set a recovery host cluster or host data store, a journal data store. I can set these all individually per VM. So there's a ton of options in here to make changes and, and tweak it and customize it to make sure that your replication goes as smoothly as possible. Um, databases can get a little uh, squirrely in any replication just because there's a lot of changes. And if you know you have a lot of write changes um, to your application, to your database, to whatever it may be, you may need to set some of these settings differently than you set it for your application servers, your web servers that don't see as much change. So I'm actually going to go previous to flush that out. I don't want that. Uh, because I changed it and I'm changing it back, it says that the service profile change is saying that it's smaller and that's fine because this is what it was before. Um, so now I have uh, storage options. So you can set things to be thin provisioned or not thin provisioned at the recovery site. So my database server, I don't want to be thin. Maybe I don't want my web server to be thin for whatever reason, but my application servers, I do want to be thin and I can make those changes again individually. The granularity of the platform is actually really, really helpful um, to making sure that all of these, to, your applications are your applications. And if I say, you know, this is the way that every application is, that's a really foolish way to go about things. So um, having this level of granularity and, and ability to make changes is important. Um, so there's two different uh, failover networks. There's a move network and a test network. The move network is where the VM lands when the when you actually do a full failover. So this is where things have gone very wrong and I want to connect my VM back to a, a real network. That's what that network is. The test network is a bubble network. So when you're doing a test and you want to make sure that your applications talk to each other and they come up properly and so on and so forth, you can connect them to the bubble network and they'll come up. Um, but they won't actually fail over public internet and you won't affect your prod environment because the worst thing that happens is a disaster recovery test causing you an actual disaster. Um, and then in here is just a more granular version of that where you can set those individual networks, those failover networks, those test networks, and you can do it again per VM. You can also set different IPs in here. So you can actually re-IP your things in here. So I can click and say, I want a static IP and then go in here and change all of these fields. Um, to re-IP it to a new IP space uh, because in my failover data center, I don't have that. In our world, we do, so everything's stretched, so you don't have to do that, but there is the option inside of the product to do that. And do the same thing with test. So it doesn't have to necessarily be the same between failover and test, which is a, a really nice feature for uh, certain, test, uh, certain test configurations and instances. Um, our service profile doesn't have long-term retention, but we can keep certain checkpoints longer. So there's an option to do that. And then this is just a summary of the actual recovery. So if we go into failover, and I know that we're cutting, we're coming short on time, so I'll, I'll keep this tight. Um, in here, this is where we're actually going to kick off a failover. We're not actually going to kick a failover of, off because we are kind of short on time here, but you have the option to fail over only certain VMs. So if I don't want to fail over my database server, I can do that. Um, and then everything will just reach back across the wire if it needs to. Um, and then in here, we have our checkpoints. So that whole ransomware um, thing that Heisberg mentioned earlier, you can go back and say, I need to go back to noon because that's when I got hit with ransomware. Right before this webinar, it was actually really bad. So I'm going to roll back to 1159.56. And you can jump back to that, that uh, checkpoint and go back to a known state. Now, you're going to lose the data that we've you know, created or any changes that have happened between 1159.56 and 1231.51, according to my clock. Um, but in the process of doing that, you go back to a known good state and not uh, have a gigantic outage during that time. 
Now, that whole ransomware concept comes into play here with the commit policy. So there's a rollback and a commit. In the event that when you actually kick over a failover, you have 60 minutes of, it, of what is basically checkup time. Make sure your application came up cleanly. Make sure you went back to a good checkpoint. Let's say that we discovered that there was a ransomware hit at noon. The actual ransomware started encrypting things at 11 a.m. I have the opportunity to roll it back, go back to the 11, the 1059 checkpoint, and go and fail back to that one. Um, once you commit your failover, it deletes all of the pre-existing snapshots and starts the snapshots from the new, uh, the new failover. So this is a like chance to kind of go, whoops, didn't mean to do that and roll back. Or yes, I definitely meant to do that. You have the option to auto roll back after a set period of time. This number is in minutes. So you can auto roll back after 60 minutes or you can auto commit after 60 minutes uh, and that can be changed. Uh, so if you want to be, if you want to go from one hour to two hours, so on and so forth, you can do that. Or you can do none and you have to manually go in and manually roll it back or manually commit, but you'll be in the uncommitted state until then. You can also turn on reverse protection. So once the commit happens, it will start doing the replication back. So if we replicate, if we fail over from ACM to 701 and I hit commit, it will start protecting from 701 back to ACM. So this gives us the ability to do a failover. And this has helped uh, one of our customers. Uh, it was an insurance company that saw they're in Florida and they saw a hurricane coming. And so they kicked off their failover at like three days before the hurricane was scheduled to, to make landfall. So their applications were up and running. Their users were up and running. Hurricane, mm, glancing blow, nothing major. But they had all of their replication back, so all they had to do was fail back once they said, okay, the hurricane's gone and we're cleared, I'll go home. They were able to do a fail back and not lose any data or any changes. So um, the only thing this is next gives you a little summary and you can click failover. Um, but that's that's the, the majority of the demo. Uh, I do want to put up uh, one last little thing here which is our, uh, these are our Gartner Peer Insights. We have 4.8 stars, 33 ratings. Our customers love this. Uh, if you wanna learn more, you can go to go.expedient.com slash PBDR dash Zerto, um, which has more information about this and uh, our disaster recovery solutions and how we can help you and, and get you in contact with somebody who can help you a little bit further. Um, and uh, I'll let David kind of jump back in. Thanks everybody. Yeah, awesome, awesome demo. AJ, thank you very much. Love seeing the product in action. It's it's really cool. A great UI, looks very easy to, to use. Uh, also, great presentation by Heisbert. We do have some questions here for you uh, uh, out there in the audience. Um, if you have a question about the solution, now's the time to get it in. I just put in the chat box there in your GoToWebinar control panel, the URL that AJ has on the screen, so you don't have to try to write it down. You can simply click on it right there in the chat box. So let's see, first question that came in, uh, they're asking, uh, Matt is asking, so with this solution, you're using Zerta replication and not Hyper-V replicate replication. Uh, is that true? Um, yeah, I mean, the the this is a VMware-based platform, so we would not be using a, a Hyper-V platform. The nice part about Zerto is that it is cross-platform. So you're capable of delivering Zerto and replicating to what may not be your source hypervisor. Uh, so that's actually a really helpful thing for us, for some customers who um, have a Hyper-V platform or they have a VMware platform or maybe they have a Nutanix AHV platform and you can replicate off of those things to a different uh, destination. Very nice, yeah, a lot of flexibility there. Um, another question they're asking, how do you know when ransomware hits can zerto detect that so uh heisberg might have a better answer to this but uh as far as i'm aware zerto doesn't do any sort of detection that's up to you zerto is the technology you would use to help recover from that um, and roll back to a previous known good state so zerto isn't out there scanning your environment looking for ransomware uh, you're probably going to get a call from a user with a big red screen that says pay us bitcoins um, 
before uh, any sort of tool is going to detect anything like that. But Heisberg might have a better answer. So I, I a great answer, by the way, AJ. The, the thing I can add, we can definitely aid with finding the right time that you need to recover to. And, and that's because if you looked at the, the, the demo, uh, there's, there's a um, graph, a statistic graph for RPO and for number of changes, IOPS. So what we can actually do is when ransomware hits and a service being encrypted, it's, it's going to generate IO. So you'll see a spike in changes. You see a spike in IOPS. You could actually use that spike and, and look at when it started and then recover to a point in time, which you can do using a failover test, for example, or a failover without commit and look at, okay, is this my data or need to go five seconds back or 30 seconds back? So we can definitely aid in helping you find the right time to recover to. Okay, very nice. And I think that might go along with this uh, question from James. He's asking, if a hosted website is hacked, do your tools help to determine when a clean restore point is for the site or the database? Is that kind of the same answer? So yes, and the, 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 the nice thing about being able to do failover tests and being able to do them basically as often as you, as you want, you can actually go through the points in time and really verify if that was the point in time where maybe it started earlier and only half of it was, was I don't know, defaced or hacked. So we, we give you the flexibility to really find that point in time. Okay, nice. Uh, Eric is asking, is NSX required for the networking to the DR site? And also, uh, second part of the question, do customers manage the DR site? So in our environment, we're doing this DR as a service. So no, you do not manage the DR site. That is, that's what we're here for. Um, we make sure to do that so you don't have to focus and spend all your time building hardware and um, maintaining and patching all that stuff. So you're paying us to do that. Um, in terms of uh, NSX, in our uh, Expedia Enterprise Cloud platform, yes. Uh, it is part of the product, though. So when you have your VMs hosted on our platform, you are getting NSX as part of that. Um, on your prem, so if you're doing this from an on-premises data center to us or to another DR as a service provider using Zerto, um, no. So that is a, we do it as part of our platform. It's part of our network automation to do the failover in a more seamless fashion. It's the same thing with, uh, we use Juniper VR, VSRX firewalls um, to do our external um, firewalling. And that's what allows us to do all of that failover seamlessly uh, from a public IP standpoint, from an internal IP standpoint. But that, that is part of the overall product. It is not something that um, you have to pay for individually. Okay, very nice. Uh, Jeffrey's asking, how do you handle third-party equipment in the data center like routers? I, I would assume that that's all virtual. That's just included with the solution. So uh, that's... it is. Go ahead, I... yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. So, uh, so I just want to add a little bit to that. So it really depends on kind of what the functionality of that router is. Uh, sometimes, depending on the size of the environment, you want to have, uh, let's say, a point-to-point -point connection between your primary and your secondary location. Uh, with Expedient, we do own and operate all of the data centers as well, so we offer co-location services. Uh, so if there are uh, pieces of network equipment or, let's say, mainframes or AS400s that are part of your disaster recovery strategy, uh, we can accommodate those as well. Very nice. Very nice. Um, Paul is asking, what VMware version is required to use Zerto? Uh, most of the... Yeah, Go most ahead. of the uh, current versions are supported. Um, so specifically for Zerto, um, I know they go back to really all of the supported uh, in-use VMware uh, vSphere platforms. Uh, for the expedient side of things, uh, because we are running a uh, VMware platform that you're replicating to, uh, we just need to make sure that both of the different sides of the environment uh, are compatible from like a virtual hardware versioning perspective. Okay, very nice. Uh, there's a few questions here uh, from Devon. Uh, he's asking, uh, do you handle Active Directory failover and failback? So Active Directory gets a little bit finicky when you're replicating it um, over. What we normally recommend doing is actually having a uh, full-time running copy of your Active Directory. Uh, so it's just a secondary or tertiary date domain controller running on the disaster recovery side. Um, that 
does two things. Uh, one, it takes away one level of dependencies when you're failing over because you already have your domain controller up, which is usually the first thing you want to bring up uh, during a disaster. Uh, the second is it prevents from any of those um, schema corruptions, things of that nature, uh, where you're replicating the Active Directory database over. Okay. All right. I know we're running out of time here. Just a couple more questions. Um, another question from Devon. Can you handle failover and failback of SQL AAGs? I mean, that would be a, a similar sort of conversation to, um, to the Active Directory one, where you have a secondary, you have a second SQL AAG server in the DR site or in the secondary data center and let SQL do that sort of replication. There's Zerto is Zerto does a really good job of handling applications that don't have native replication or you know application level replication functionality to them, right? So if I have a SQL database or I have an Oracle database or Active Directory or maybe DNS servers, those sorts of things where the application itself can propagate changes. Um, and handle it across multiple sites, that's usually a better way to go about this and let Zerto handle the things that um, are part of, or that can't do that themselves. So my web server, my database server that I have, and my two application servers, they don't have that native functionality in it. Um, you know, Brent, that should be on our list of things to fix in our demo environment, you know, to have a more highly available application. But this is why Zerto does what it does. It does a really great job of handling these applications and giving you that functionality without having to completely refactor the application. Okay. Okay. And let's see, if people go to the URL that I placed there in the chat um, to learn more, is there a, a demo they can sign up for? Or what do you recommend as their first step? Um, so go there, uh, go read all of the things that we have out there. We have a number of push button DR case studies uh, that are available uh, from our website. There's also a Let's Talk link at the top and, uh, you know, get in touch with us and we can sit down and go through your specific scenario. Um, you know, Brent is one of our solutions architects, so he's very familiar with these sorts of questions. And we get a lot of questions about DR all the time, but this is where, you know, we have hundreds of customers protecting thousands of VMs with our push button DR platform. So this is not something, you know, you guys are probably going to bring, uh, you know, some fairly common scenarios to us. And we have a lot of solutions to help protect against all those, or to help protect you and your data and your applications. So um, get in touch with us and let's talk. Excellent, excellent. I know there's a number of questions here we still uh, haven't yet answered, but we will do our best to get back to those uh, via email. Uh, so many great questions, uh, obviously a lot of interest and excitement around this push button DR solution. Uh, AJ and Heisberg, uh, excellent presentations and demo. Uh, thank you so much for being on the event today. Thanks for having us, David. Thanks for having us. And thank you to Zerto and Expedient for uh, sponsoring today's event. I hope everyone learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed seeing the solution in action. Uh, for more information, click the URL that's there in the chat. Also, don't forget about those handouts that are available for download in the handouts tab. Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining today's event. Have a great day. See you next time.